good. Okay. Okay, Sula. Okay, it's uh, very nice to have the opportunity to uh, present Catherine here, who is a old friend and long time collaborator. It's really ages since we collaborated uh, and it's always fun. And we are very happy that she uh, accepted the invitation to come. Catherine is professor at the University of Waterloo. Uh, two of my former students have done a postdoc with Catherine. So many of them know the university very well. And one student is just starting a doctoral degree also at the University of Waterloo. And now Catherine is uh, thinking to retire, although she is much too young for that. So she believes <laughs> she's going to continue working and probably in a very, very nice place of Canada once we are past this pandemic, hopefully. So Catherine will talk about the size of self-similar sets and measures. And Catherine, it's all yours. Well, thanks, Ursula. Oh, as Ursula said, we are very old friends. <laughs> I've been friends for a very, very long time, and it's uh, it's nice to be with you, at least in this in this technological sense. And thanks for the invitation to speak. So I want to talk about um, various ways we might think about the size of, of sets and measures, particularly self-similar sets and measures, and I'll explain what those are as we go along. When I say sets, I, I really do mean subsets of Rn, mostly subsets of R, although some of what I'm gonna say does generalize to, to more arbitrary situations. And of course, there's many ways that we can think about the size of subsets of Rn. Perhaps the way that comes to mind first is cardinality. That's a good way to distinguish finite sets, uh, saying one is bigger than the other, or finite from infinite, or countable from uncountable. But it doesn't help at all to, to distinguish the size of uncountable sets. They're simply all as big as they could possibly be in the cardinality sense. For that, we might find Lebesgue measure more useful. Um, it's a way to compare the size of, of, of subsets of Rn. Uh, but again, doesn't distinguish all sets. And in particular, sets of measure zero, or according to Lebesgue measure, would all have the same size. But some might be extremely small, even the empty set or a singleton, and others could be uncountable, even in size. And of course, we have various notions of, of size in different branches of mathematics. We talk about dimensions of manifolds in geometry or dimensions of vector spaces in linear algebra. But these only apply to very particular kinds of subsets of Rn. But there are many other notions of dimension, and I want to talk about a few of them today. So first one I want to mention is, is box dimension, because this is, I think, the, the easiest to describe. So let's just first of all suppose we take the unit square in R2 and think about covering it by a very fine grid, size R by R. So we have all these little squares size r by r. And how many of these squares intersect the unit square? Well, it'll be about 1 over r squared. And it's not a coincidence that we have this exponent 2 for this unit square that we call two-dimensional. Or we might think about um, a curve, a nice curve embedded in rn, perhaps arc length 1, and cover this curve with little n-dimensional cubes, well, I can't draw cubes very well, but say little cubes of side lengths r. And, and how many cubes are going to be required to cover this, this curve of length 1? Well, it'll be about 1 over r, or 1 over r to the invisible exponent 1 for this one-dimensional set. And how do we recover these exponents? 
well, in the first case, we could just take log of one over r squared and divide by log of one over r. And of course we get the answer of two coming up. Well, this is the idea behind the box dimension, but we can apply this principle to any bounded subset of Rn. We take our bounded set E and a small number r, and then we can let n sub r of E be any of the following numbers. It could be the number of elements from, a, from an n-dimensional R mesh or R grid that intersect E, or it could be the least number of n-dimensional balls of diameter R or radius R, if you prefer, that cover E, or the least number of n-dimensional cubes of diameter R or side lengths R that cover E or any sets of diameter R that cover E. I'm not saying that these numbers are all the same because they won't be in general, but if you do the following operation, you will get the same answer, whichever one you start with. Take log of that number and then divide by log of one over R, which is the same thing as absolute value of log of R because R we're thinking of is small. In fact, we let R go to zero. And that limit is what's called the box dimension of the, spit, the set E. So that if these covering numbers N R of E are like R, little r to the s, then what happens when you do this operation is you pick out that exponent s. Now, of course, the limit might not exist. We, we might have to go with a limb inf or a limb soup, and then we'd be talking about upper and lower box dimensions, but it's the same principle. And this notion of dimension does generalize the notion of dimension of a manifold. If, you, in, if your set E is a manifold of dimension little n, it will give you box dimension little n. And the box dimension of a singleton, for instance, is zero, as you would expect. Always the box dimension for a subset of Rn will be a number between zero and n, but it doesn't have to be an integer. And a nice example of that is the Cantor set. So let me just remind you of the definition of the Cantor set in case you haven't thought about it for a while. You start with the interval, the closed interval zero, one, and remove from this the middle interval of length one third. So you keep the two outer intervals of length one third, zero to one third, two thirds to one. And then you do this again. You remove the middle third of each of these and you keep the outer intervals whose lengths are one third that of the parent interval. So now they're length one ninth, zero to a ninth, two ninths to a third and so on. And you just keep doing this. You keep removing the middle thirds and keep the, the outer thirds. And maybe we can call this first one here C0, step one, that would be the, the, four, the two intervals here of length one third is C1, the four intervals of length a ninth will be the set C2 and so on. And the Cantor set is what is left when you do this process forever. So it's the intersection of these sets CN. And I suppose the first thing is we should observe that there is something left over there are lots of things left over, in fact. Well, the point zero, for example, is clearly in every one of the sets CN. It's the leftmost endpoint, the left endpoint of the leftmost interval. And similarly, the point one is in every one of these sets being the, the rightmost point of the rightmost interval at every step along the way. But there's lots of other points as well. For example, one third. Obviously, it's in C0 because that's the whole interval zero, one. It's an endpoint of one of these two intervals that make up C1, and thereafter it is an endpoint of one of the intervals in Cn, and so it is in every set Cn. And similarly, all the points that are endpoints of one of these intervals that arises in the construction at some step in the construction, from then on it's an endpoint and therefore it stays in every Cn. And so all of those points are in the Cantor set. And there are infinitely many of those points, right? So this is certainly an infinite set. However, those points are all rational numbers and actually the Cantor set is uncountable. So it's actually the case that most of the points in the Cantor set are not endpoints of these intervals. They're much harder to, to visualize geometrically. A Couple of facts maybe to observe about the Cantor set. These sets Cn well, every time you do this process of removing a, a middle interval, 
you will double the number of intervals you had from the previous step. So CN is gonna consist of two to the N closed intervals. And each time we cut the length of the intervals that we keep by a factor of a three. So at step N, the intervals that we keep have length three to the minus N. And each of the intervals at step N is separated by one of these removed gaps. And so it's separated by a gap of length, at least three to the minus N. The set CN being just a finite union of closed intervals are all closed sets. So our Cantor set is closed and it's obviously bounded because it's in zero one. So it's a compact set. It's a totally disconnected set because between any two points in the Cantor set, you will have one of these removed intervals. So it's a very sparse set, but as I said, it's uncountable. So it's a huge sparse set, at least huge in cardinality sense. It's as large as the entire real line even. But this is one of these uncountable sets of Lebesgue measure zero, because if you want to compute the Lebesgue measure of the Cantor set, well, that's going to be at most the Lebesgue measure of any one of the sets CN because it's contained in the set CN. And for a union of intervals, the, the measure, the Lebesgue measure of the set is just the sum of the lengths of the intervals. So this is two to the N times three to the minus N. And that of course goes to zero as N goes to infinity. So Cantor set has Lebesgue measure zero. So is the Cantor set a big set or a small set? According to cardinality, it's as big as it could possibly be. And according to Lebesgue measure, it's as small as it could possibly be. So what is it? Well, maybe we can resolve this computing the box dimension. So how do we compute the box dimension? Remember, we are supposed to get these covering numbers. In theory, you're supposed to do it for every, every little r, but it's gonna be enough just to use the powers of a third. So let's think about covering the Cantor set with, with balls of size three to the minus N. Um, well, balls in, in R are just intervals. So we wanna cover it with intervals of length three to the minus N. What can we do? Well, obviously we can use the intervals from, from CN. That covers the Cantor set and there's two to the N of them. So we, we definitely don't need more than two to the N. But on the other hand, if we think about the, the left endpoints of those intervals, they are farther apart than three to the minus N. So however you try to cover this, the Cantor set with intervals of length three to the minus N, those endpoints would have to belong to different elements of your cover. So we must have at least two to the minus N elements in any cover. And so we get equality. So that's how we got the equality there. And then we're supposed to take log of that number, divide by log of three to the minus N, absolute value, which is the same as three to the N, log of three to the N. And the Ns will come down, cancel off. We're left with log two over log three, which amusingly is close to two thirds. So there's our box dimension, log two over log three. It's not even a rational number. But I would say from this that the Cantor set is a relatively large set of Lebesgue measure zero because any subset of the real line will have its box dimension between zero and one. And this one is around two thirds, closer to one than it is to zero, so a relatively large set. Now this Cantor set that I've drawn for you is something called the classical middle third Cantor set, but there's nothing really special about keeping the outer intervals of length one third that of the parent. We could keep the outer intervals of length one quarter or one fifth that of the parent. Doesn't even have to be a rational proportion, just some number rho, that proportion of the parent's length. The number rho should be less than a half. So we are still removing something but as long as we go through exactly the same process, but at each step we keep the intervals whose length is rho times that of the parent, we will end up with another, another Cantor set, which is homeomorphic to the original one and is uncountable and is of Lebesgue measure zero. But as the number rho gets smaller and smaller, you might feel that these sets are getting smaller and smaller because we're keeping less each time and that, of course, is not reflected by either cardinality or Lebesgue measure. 
They're all the same size according to both cardinality and Lebesgue measure, but box dimension does distinguish them. If you go through the same reasoning to compute the box dimension, you quickly see that for the Cantor set where we use the ratio rho, the box dimension is log two over the absolute value of log rho. And that does in fact decrease monotonically to zero as rho decreases to zero. So that's consistent with our, I think would be our intuition that these sets do indeed get smaller as rho gets smaller. So box dimension is at least consistent with our, our intuition here. And this is a very pra practical way to compute size or at least to estimate it. <clears throat> and it's been used in many ways. For instance, you could think about trying to measure the size of a coastline. That'd be very difficult to do if you pulled out your measuring tape and tried to go along the coastline because you've got bays and then you've got smaller bays off big bays and coves off those and little, you know, goes on and on and on. But you could imagine taking your map and covering it with a grid and, and making an estimate on the box dimension of the coastline. So people looked at coastlines, snowflakes, clouds, lots of things. It's very practical in that way but uh, does have a mathematical drawback. And that is, it does not behaved well under countability properties. And in particular, there are countable sets that have positive house, the box dimension. You can, if you like to little exercise, you can check that the, the set of points, one over N, one, one half, one third, et cetera, uh, that set has box dimension one half. That means its box dimension is bigger than than some uncountable sets. And that's just completely wrong. So for one, this is one reason why mathematicians sometimes prefer a different notion of dimension to work with, namely the Hausdorff dimension, which is a little bit more complicated to explain, but has, has much better mathematical properties because it has at its foundation a measure or really a family of measures, the, the Hausdorff S measures. So here's how we would compute the Hausdorff dimension of a set F, a subset of Rn. We take our set F and we look at how we can cover it with sets Ui whose diameter is less than or equal to delta. So delta is just some fixed positive number and we're also gonna fix some number S non-negative. So we look at these covers, we add up the diameters of Ui to the power S and then take the infimum over all possible covers like this. And that is the HS delta measure of F. As delta gets smaller and smaller, but we think of S as fixed now, we let delta get smaller and smaller, and there'll be fewer and fewer of these covers. So the infimum is going to rise. And so as you let delta go to zero, this limit here does indeed exist because it's a supremum. And that is the Hausdorff S measure of F. And the way this measure behaves as you vary S is it turns out that there's an index S naught where on the left side, the Hausdorff S measure of, of the fixed set F is plus infinity and on the right side, it's zero. And this index where the switch occurs, that index is the Hausdorff dimension of F. For that choice of S, you might have the Hausdorff S measure of F positive and finite. You might have it zero, you might have it infinity, but it is only at that index that the answer could be anything other than zero or infinity. So that's our, our Hausdorff dimension. And this notion of dimension also generalizes the usual notion of dimension of manifolds. It'll always give back an answer between zero and n for subsets of Rn, but it does have better countability properties. And in particular, any countable set will have Hausdorff dimension zero. The box dimension is always an upper bound on the Hausdorff dimension, and often the two are equal, but not necessarily, but often they're equal. So we they have this nice way to compute an upper bound on the Hausdorff dimension, but the lower bounds are, are often harder to find because since the definition is, is via this infimum property, it, you know, it, it is more difficult to get lower bounds. But fortunately we have what's known as the mass distribution principle. <clears throat> 
And the mass distribution principle says, if there is a measure mu, which lives on your set and has the property that the measure of any set u is at most a constant times the diameter of u to the power s, then s is going to be a lower bound on the Hausdorff dimension of f. And we can apply this principle to our Cantor set, our middle third Cantor set to compute its Hausdorff dimension. What we can use for the probability measure mu would be the uniform Cantor measure. And what I mean by the uniform Cantor measure is the measure which is uniformly distributed across the Cantor set. So what it does is it's going to assign mass one to the entire Cantor set. And it will assign mass one half to each of the two intervals from the first step in the construction, half here and half here. And then each of the four intervals that come up at the next step, they will each get weight one quarter and so on. So that's what I mean by uniform. This, this measure is assigning the mass in such a way that the measure looks the same everywhere. And it's easy to check that it has this property when you take S to be log two over log three. So log two over log three is a lower bound on the Hausdorff dimension of the Cantor set by the mass distribution principle. It's an upper bound because that's the box dimension and the box dimension is always an upper bound. And so we have that the Hausdorff dimension in this case coincides with the box dimension. They're both log two over log three. <clears throat> now, the construction I gave you, the Cantor set really focused, uh, well, it's a nice geometric construction, but there's another way you can think about the Cantor set. And that is by focusing on the, the similarity properties of this set. If you look at the Cantor set, you think about what the Cantor set looks like in zero one. And then think about what it looks like, the part of it in zero one third. You know, you remove the middle third, then you remove middle thirds again, then you remove middle thirds again. And you just end up seeing a copy of the original Cantor set, but scaled down by a factor of three. And the same thing over on the other side in two thirds to one, you remove the middle third, you remove middle thirds. You, again, you just see a copy of the Cantor set again, a rescaled translated over copy. And the way we can express that mathematically is if we take the two maps, x over three and x over three plus a third. So scale it, scale it by a third and translate it. When you apply these two functions to the Cantor set, you get the, first of all, the part of the Cantor set in zero a third and, and then you get the part of the Cantor set in two thirds to one. And the Cantor set turns out to be the unique non-empty compact set, which is equal to these two images, the rescaled images of itself. Well, this is the idea behind a self-similar set. For a self-similar set, we start off with an iterated function system, which is a finite collection of, of maps of the form rjx plus dj, where rj should be a number strictly less than one. So these are all contractions. And anytime you start with a finite set of maps like this, there is always, you can prove this using the the bonnet contraction mapping principle, there's always a unique non-empty compact set K, which is invariant under these maps in the sense that K is the union of the iterates of these maps. And that is what we mean by a self-similar set, a set which arises through this process and it is equal to these rescaled copies of itself. Now, one of the other nice things about the, the middle third Cantor set is that the two pieces of that Cantor set, S0 of Cantor set and S1 of the Cantor set, they are separated, right? They've got the two pieces and there was a gap between them. If you have a nice separation property kind of like this called the open set condition, then there's a simple formula for the box and Hausdorff dimensions of the self-similar set. They coincide and the number is, is the value S where S is given by this formula involving the contraction factors from the similarities. <clears throat>
Okay, so the military commander said quick to check that this is the number log two over log three. So that's a nice simple way to calculate the Hausdorff dimension of these self-similar sets that satisfy the open set condition. But if they you don't have the open set condition, if you've got overlap, then the situation is much more complicated. And the formula that's given there can certainly be wrong. I mean, one way you can quickly convince yourself the formula could be wrong is you might have an iterative function system where two of the maps, SI and SJ, are identical. And in that case, whether you use only one of those functions in your IFS or use them both, you will end up with the same self-similar set K. But the formula will give you two different answers, right? Depending upon which one you apply it to. Uh, furthermore, we're talking here about subsets of R. So the Hausdorff dimension is going to be at most one. And so it turns out that the Hausdorff dimension is always at most the minimum of the S that comes from that formula and one. But even here, you can have strict inequality. And it, it's a conjecture that the strict inequality can only occur if you have exact overlaps. That is, if some composition of the maps SI equals some other composition. This, this seems, well, there is some evidence for this based on some deep work of Hookman, but it seems to be a very difficult conjecture to resolve. Well, there's much, much more one could say about the size of, of sets, but I want to move on and talk about what we can say about the size of measures. How can we quantify measures? And by a measure, I'm going to simply mean a, a Borel probability measure on Rn. And you might recall that every measure on Rn, you can write in a unique way as a sum of two measures, one of which is called absolutely continuous. Very roughly speaking, that means it looks an awful lot like Lebesgue measure. And the other is what's called singular. These are measures which are completely different from Lebesgue measure because they in fact live on sets of Lebesgue measure zero. Okay, so they're invisible as far as Lebesgue measure is concerned. The absolutely continuous ones are to me less interesting. I'm very interested in the singular ones because they're quite diverse. For one extreme example would be a point mass measure, which I've just denoted here is delta sub A. A is a, sp a special point in, in Rn. And the way this measure will work is it assigns to a subset E the value one if that special point A is in E and otherwise you get the value zero. That's a singular measure because it, it puts all of its mass on the singleton A and a singleton is certainly of Lebesgue measure zero. But a very different example of a singular measure is our uniform counter measure, which I'm going to call new one half for reasons that will be clear very shortly. This measure is also singular because it lives on the counter set, which is again of Lebesgue measure zero, but it's very, very different from the point mass measure that's putting all of its mass on one point. This measure spreads its mass across this, this large uncountable set, the counter set. And it has the property that the measure of any single point is zero. So in this sense, I think this is a much larger measure. Right? It's very diffuse as opposed to the first one that is very concentrated. And there are various ways that we can quantify that as well. In particular, there is a notion of Hausdorff dimension of a measure. Basically, you look for the smallest set in the Hausdorff dimension sense, that the smallest set that the measure assigns positive mass to. So that's going to be an answer between zero and n because Hausdorff dimension of sets in Rn is always between zero and n. And our, our point mass measure has the smallest Hausdorff dimension possible, zero, because it assigns mass to singletons which have Hausdorff dimension zero. Absolutely continuous measures, they all have Hausdorff dimension n as big as possible. But other singular measures can be anything between zero and n. And in particular, our uniform counter measure it turns out it has Hausdorff dimension log two over log three, the same as the Hausdorff dimension of the counter set itself. So that's kind of interesting because that is telling us that this uniform counter measure 
does not assign positive mass to any subset of the Cantor set that is smaller than the entire Cantor set in, its, in the sense of its Hausdorff dimension. Well, like the notion of self-similar set, we have self-similar measure. Again, coming from an iterative function system where we have finitely many similarities, SJ. And then we associate with each SJ probabilities, PJ. And what I mean by that is these should be positive numbers that add to one. And anytime we have that set up, then another application of the Bonnet contraction mapping principle can be used to prove that there is a unique probability measure, which is invariant under these parameters in the sense that the measure of any set E is the sum PJ times the measure of SJ inverse of E. And such a measure is called a self-similar measure. Our uniform Cantor measure, nu one half, is an example of this. You start with the two similarities that generate the Cantor set and assign the probabilities one half, one half. That's why I'm calling it nu one half. Now, so I've said that every measure you can write as a sum of an absolutely continuous one and a singular one. Most measures are a combination of the two, but self-similar measures have the property that they are either purely absolutely continuous or purely singular. And of course, this uniform Cantor measure is purely singular because it lives on the Cantor set. But it is only one measure, self-similar measure that lives on that Cantor set. We can get a whole family of measures, the P Cantor measures, by taking the same two maps that generate the Cantor set and using the probabilities P and one minus P, where P is any number between zero and one. And the way these measures work, they will assign mass one to the entire interval zero one. And then to our two intervals from step one, we'll give mass P to the left and one minus P to the right. And then the general rule is hereafter, a left child will get measure P times the parent. So P times P, P squared here. And a right child will get measure one minus P times the parent. So this is one minus P times P. This is a left child here. So it's P times the parent. And this one is a right child, so it's one minus p times the measure of the parent. And you can see that this measure is, if p is not one half, this is not uniformly distributed across the Cantor set. It's, it's got a bias to it, right? Depending on which is bigger, p or one minus p, you put more weight on one side or the other. So these are all different measures, although they're all coming from the same iterative function system. And they have different levels of concentration, even though they all have the same support, the Cantor set, because there is a nice formula for computing the Hausdorff dimension of self-similar measures that come from an iterative function system that satisfies the open set condition. We have a nice formula in terms of the probabilities and the contraction factors. And when you apply this formula to the P Cantor measures, you see that the Hausdorff dimension um, is a, continuous function of P, right? it varies with P. So they have different Hausdorff dimensions, even though they all are supported on the Cantor set. Now, the Hausdorff dimension is one way we could think about the size of the measure, and it's certainly one good tool for distinguishing between two different measures. But it doesn't give us all the information about the measure. And if we have a measure like our or P Cantor measures where P is not one half that are not the same everywhere, we don't get any that kind of information at all. If we have a measure that's very concentrated in some parts of the space and much less concentrated in others, we're not, uh, we're not seeing that at all because Hausdorff dimension is a global property. If we want local information about the measure, then we should have a notion of dimension that's, that's a local notion and in fact, there is such a dimension called the local dimension of mu, which we have a different, potentially different value for at every x in the support of the measure. So for this, we, we, we want to look at the behavior of the measure locally around x. So we look at the measure of, of a ball centered at x and radius r, 
we take log of that and divide out log r and let r go to zero. So again, this is picking up kind of the power law behavior because if this measure is like r to the s for small r, we're gonna pick up the exponent s. And although in principle, you know, you might think you'd get a different answer at every x in the support, that that's not true because one number comes up most of the time, and that is the Hausdorff dimension. At least for a self-similar measure, the Hausdorff dimension of the measure comes up as the local dimension at almost every point, almost every point in the mu sense of the word. But there's still a could be a very large set of mu measure zero on which you can have very different values. And that is the case with our, with our P Cantor measures, for instance. We have different local dimensions at just even at zero and one. If we want the local dimension at zero, we should work out the measure of the ball centered at zero, radius three to the minus n. Well, really intersected with the Cantor set because that's where the, the measure lives. So really we're talking about the interval zero out to three to the minus n. That is the leftmost interval at step n in the construction. And that is a left child at every generation. So its measure is p to the n. So then to get the local dimension at zero, we would take log of p to the n and divide by log of three to the minus n. And when you simplify, you get log p over log a third. But if you do the same thing at one, well, now you're looking at the interval one minus three to the n to one. This is the rightmost interval at step n in the construction and is a right child at every generation. So its measure is one minus p to the n. And computing the local dimension at one, you get this different value, log one minus p over log one third. So there's at least two values taken on by this measure. In fact, these are the two extreme values of local dimensions for this measure, basically because p to the n and one minus p to the n are the extreme values that the measure assigns at, at step n in the construction. And not only are they the two extreme values, you actually get as the set of attainable local dimensions, all the local dimensions as you vary x over the Cantor set, it is this closed interval with the endpoints being the local dimension at zero and one. Now I've written as if the local dimension at zero is the smaller of these two numbers, but of course that depends on whether P is bigger or smaller than a half. And the fact that this is a, an interval of dimensions, I think is very intuitively satisfying because these measures, although they're singular, they're really very nice measures and they're very smooth in some sense and they change very gradually. In fact, there are examples of what are called continuous measures, meaning the measure of a singleton is zero. But I mean, it suggests that we should have this continuum here. So this is very, I think, intuitively natural. And in fact, this continues to be the case for any self-similar measure coming from an iterated function system that satisfies the open set condition. It is always the case for such measures that the set of local dimensions is an interval, a closed interval, with nice simple formulas for the endpoints of those intervals in terms of the contraction factors Ri and the probabilities Pi. And it's even known how we can calculate the size of the sets where a given value is attained, size meaning Hausdorff dimension. There are formulas for these. So these are very well understood when you satisfy the open set condition. Hey, but what if you don't? And there are many interesting examples of measures that do not, that are self-similar measures, but come from IFS that do not satisfy the open set condition. A very interesting family of examples are what are known as the Bernoulli convolutions. And these are measures which again arise from an iterative function system with two contractions, like with our Cantor set, Rx and Rx plus one minus R, but this time R is a number bigger than a half. With the Cantor set constructions, R was to be less than a half. So what's going on here is that when you start with the interval zero one and you apply these two maps, you're gonna get zero R and then because R is more than a half, 
the other interval, one minus r to one, overlaps. Right, so you've got this overlapping portion. The Bernoulli convolutions arise by taking as our probabilities half half. If you if you think of it as a putting half here and half here, then it's very unclear what's going on in this overlapping part. So these are much more complicated to understand. A bit oddly, perhaps, the self-similar set is actually the full interval 0, 1, not what one usually perhaps thinks of as a fractal, but that's the way it is. These measures have been studied for more than 80 years, um, and there's still many important open problems on them. They come up in many branches of mathematics. One of the oldest results still important is due to Erdos in 1939. So remember, these measures have as their support the, the, comp the, the, the interval 0, 1. But he showed that these measures are singular when the ratio, the contraction factor R, is the inverse of a piezo number. So a piezo number, you might remember, is an algebraic number bigger than 1, all of whose Galois conjugates have modulus strictly less than 1. A favorite example is the golden mean. And what Erdos actually did was to show that if you took a look at the Fourier transform of this measure, using algebraic properties of piezo numbers, he showed that the Fourier transform does not go to zero as n goes to infinity. And then call upon a classical theorem in Fourier analysis, the riemann lebesgue lemma, which says, for an absolutely continuous measure, the Fourier transform must go to zero. So these ones cannot be absolutely continuous. But remember, self-similar ones have to either be absolutely continuous or singular, so these have to be purely singular. But not all Bernoulli convolutions are, are purely singular. Some of them are purely absolutely continuous. A very large class of examples was found in 1962 by Garcia, again, depending on some algebraic properties. And this was the largest explicit set of examples of absolutely continuous Bernoulli convolutions until fairly recently when Varjou gave some additional examples. But this is one of these cases where something happens a lot of the time, but it's hard to find even one example of it. Um, and Salomiak proved that almost all of these Bernoulli convolutions are absolutely continuous. And here I mean almost all in the Lebesgue measure sense the Lebesgue measure, almost all the ratios are between one half and one, the corresponding Bernoulli convolution will be absolutely continuous. His work then led to a flurry of work. A few of the papers here I've, I've highlighted, but I think the, the, most, the, the best result at this stage is due to Schmerken, who's proven that not only is the set where the Bernoulli convolution is singular coming from an class of R's of the big measure zero, it's actually a set of Hausdorff dimension zero. So this is a very, very small set of R's where you get singular Bernoulli convolutions. Of course, the piezo numbers are algebraic, so there's only countably many of those, and hence that is certainly of Hausdorff dimension zero. But to this day, it is unknown if there are any other singular Bernoulli convolutions. It may be that Erdos found them all 80 years ago. Local dimensions have also been studied for these Bernoulli convolutions, especially in the Piso case. And Feng, for instance, proved that if your contraction factor is a simple Piso number, which is a subclass of all the Pisos, but there's infinitely many simple Pisos, it's still the case, even though the open set condition fails, it's still the case that the set of, of local dimensions is a closed interval. So we still have that nice property and he was still able to work out the endpoints of the interval and, and formulas for the Hausdorff dimension of the sets where particular values are attained. So Bernoulli convolutions are one interesting class. Another interesting class of examples are convolutions of Cantor measures. So we could take our, our uniform Cantor measure on the middle third Cantor set, and we can convolve it with itself some number of times. So convolution is a process of taking two measures and producing another one. And in this case, the measure you will get if you convolve new one half with itself m times is again a self-similar measure, but now we need m plus one contractions, and we have to choose the probability suitably. When you convolve two measures, 
to get the support of the, the, the new measure that's produced, you add the supports of the original ones. So the support of the m-fold convolution is going to be the m-fold sum of the Cantor set. Of course, the Cantor set has Lebesgue measure zero, but you might recall that if you add the Cantor set to itself, you already get the interval, the whole interval zero two. And this continues to be true. If you take an m-fold sum, you will get the whole interval zero m. So that's the support of these measures, but they are still singular. And in fact, even their Fourier transforms don't go to zero. Now, of course, the open set condition holds in the case of m equals one, because that's just the standard Cantor measure. When m equals two, what happens is we end up with three subintervals. They just touch. That is good enough for the open set condition. So again, the set of local dimensions is a closed interval. The general theory applies. But when m is three or more, it turns out that the you'll get four maps when m is three, and they they overlap. And this is true for larger m as well. So the open set condition fails. But convolution is defined through an averaging process. And of course, averaging tends to make things better, right? It smooths out the extreme behavior. And so we would expect these measures to have even nicer local behavior than the Cantor measure itself. So even though it fails the open set condition, I think people were very surprised when Hu and Law discovered that the set of local dimensions for the threefold convolution the middle on the middle third Cantor set is not an interval. It has this interval part, and then there's a point to the right. This isolated point to the right, that is the local dimension at the two ends of the support of the measure, zero and three. And it is staying a positive distance away from the rest of the space. So that is telling us that well, when you convolve, you tend to put more measure to the center and less on the sides. There is so much less at the end that we have a much higher local dimension there, a very different value for the local dimension. Their method of proof here was, was pretty brutal. Um, bare hands computational, taking explicit advantage of the combinatorial structure of the threefold sum of the Cantor set. You could probably you could generalize this. You could look at the fourfold convolution on the Cantor one four set if you like. Get the same kind of conclusion, but um, going beyond that, I think would be pretty torturous. Better to produce a, a more general method, and this has been done. To look at Cantor measures where we look at the Cantor sets where the ratio of dissection, the proportion we keep, is one over an integer. And here you've got that the open set condition will hold for an m-fold convolution if m is smaller than that integer d. But as soon as it hits d or goes beyond, the open set condition fails. And as soon as it fails, there is always an isolated point in the set of local dimensions of these measures. So what, what exactly is going on here? Do we have... I mean, are these the pathological examples where we have an isolated point? Or the Bernoulli convolutions that Feng looked at where they didn't have an isolated point, even though still the open set condition fails? Or is that the more natural or, or what? Well, I think for a while people thought these were perhaps the pathological ones, but in some sense, they are in fact what we expect to happen in the overlapping case. And with my, my colleague, Kevin Hare, who I have to always say is no relative, it's just coincidence that we have the same last name. We looked at the case of taking an iterated function system where we have the same contraction factor on each of them, as is the case with the Bernoulli convolutions and the convolutions of Cantor measures. And where we get the self-similar set is zero one, which is the way it is with the Bernoulli convolutions or the Cantor measures once you, you normalize them. And first we proved that if, the, if you take two adjacent iterates and they non-trivially overlap, every one of them, and the probability associated with the, the first contraction is the minimal one, 
there will always be an isolated point in the set of local dimensions that will be occurring at the local dimension at zero. Or likewise, if the last probability is minimal, you will always have an isolated point in the set of local dimensions at the other endpoint, one. And this theorem, for example, covers biased Bernoulli convolutions. I talked about the classical case where you use the probability half-half, but you can use probabilities p and one minus p. And as soon as you bias it, if p is not one half, you're, you're either gonna have p or one minus p, the smaller of the two, and this theorem applies and says always there is an isolated point. What happens in Feng's examples where he looked at the simple piezo numbers as the contraction factor on the Bernoulli convolution and he took the uniform Bernoulli convolution. If you take those same contraction factors and you have a biased Bernoulli convolution, you end up with an interval, an isolated point. And as P tends to a half, this is P not equal to a half, as P tends to a half, this point moves down and the interval moves up and it ends up when P equals a half, the local dimension at the endpoint becomes the upper end of the interval, meets up with the upper end of the interval part. So in a sense, it's a fluke that there was not an isolated point in Feng's family of examples. And then also under a slightly stronger technical overlap condition, if you have the first and last probabilities equal and minimal, which is the case with the M-fold convolutions of the Cantor measures, there will always be an isolated point in the set of local dimensions. And this theorem applies to all of the convolutions of say uniform Cantor measures. It doesn't matter that the contraction factor on the Cantor set is one over an integer. It does not need to be. All we need to have is large enough M, M greater or equal to one over R so that that technical, that overlap condition is satisfied. And then always there is an isolated point in the set of local dimensions. So, well, given that, if you can have an isolated point, I mean, how bad could these sets be? These sets of local dimensions, how, what, how different could these local behaviors be? Well, it turns out actually not too bad, really. And in recent work with my colleague, Kevin Hare and some students, particularly Alex Rudar, we have been looking at a, a unified way to look at the, this problem of studying the local dimensions of self-similar sets in a fairly general situation. They don't have to all have the same contraction factor. The self-similar set does not have to be zero one. They just need to satisfy a, a fairly modest, I think it's fair to say, uh, separation condition basically. And under that setup, uh, we can prove that the set of local dimensions for your measure is always a finite union of closed intervals. It could be that some of those closed intervals are degenerate and are just singletons. That's when you see those isolated points, but it's always simply a finite union of closed intervals. And we've also been able to generalize from the open set condition, the formulas for finding the Hausdorff dimension of the sets on which a given value is attained. Um, the number of closed intervals uh, that is controlled by the geometry of the contractions. But whether or not those intervals actually overlap and we just see one interval or they're disjoint and we see many intervals, that is a complicated property to do with the probabilities. There, we don't see any technical reason why there couldn't be a large number of closed intervals, perhaps an arbitrarily large number of closed intervals, but we at this moment have no way, no idea on how to prove that. We don't even know how to create the, um, the, the properties that would permit a large number of closed intervals, assuming we had the right conditions on the probabilities to make them disjoint which is another very difficult problem in itself. So there's lots of things to think about there. Lots of open questions, although we now know a lot, you know, we do know a fair amount. And let me just finish with just a, 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 a sentence or two for the experts here. 
uh, in the room, um, this modest conditions. We do this for a class that we call the finite neighbor condition, which may actually be equivalent to the weak separation condition. And under this property, we can encode all the information that we need to study the local dimension property into a finite graph. And then we can take advantage of the combinatorial structure of that graph in proving, proving these results. But to go beyond that, to go beyond the weak separation condition, I think it would take very, very new ideas. So thank you for, for coming to my talk and uh, hope you enjoy your summer day while I am sitting here freezing in Canada. <laughs> Okay, we thank Catherine for a very clear and beautiful talk. Um, I, I checked the chat. There were no questions in the chat. Uh, Nico, if you want to 